We will begin our presentation now. Um, today is our first installment of a series of webinars regarding the BRT planning guide, which was released this past October. For this first session, we will, which is titled BRT 101, Planning a BRT. We have our host, Ame Gautier from ITDP. She is our chief program officer and one of the organizers and contributors to the BRT planning guide. Thanks, Christina. Welcome everybody. Um, uh, there's a lot of material to cover, so uh, just a kind of a caveat before we get started. Uh, this is an intro to planning a BRT based on the BRT planning guide. So there's, it's going to be pretty high level, but hopefully each um, will be able to get into more depth with following webinars on certain specific topics. And we'll highlight, highlight the ones that we've already started or, or planned. But um, to get started on this, uh, on this day, on this webinar, um, I wanted to start with the idea that, you know, the fundamental piece of, of, um, of our cities is that public transport is our mobility backbone. It's what allows uh, the most efficiency um, given the fact that our streets are our most precious and sacred and scarce public space. So, um, so given that this is our dynamic, that public transport is our mobility backbone, backbone but yet our streets are, are scarce and um, this is how we normally plan streets. This is an image from Copenhagen Eyes um, and I really like it. So this, we normally plan streets thinking only about the car when we need to be thinking about a more equitable approach to planning our streets, which is all the other modes included, including walking, cycling, and public transport. And it's really about efficiency of our road space, our, again, our most scarce and sacred public space. Um, how can we use that to the most advantage for the most people? Um, and this is just a, a quick schematic of capacity given different types of configurations on our streets. And you see that with public transport, with bus rapid transit, you can move a lot more people more efficiently. And even in our cities that have large rail networks, most um, public transport trips are happening on bus. So our road space and the way that we design our bus systems are really, uh, really important. But what we see now is that currently our conditions are not great. <clears throat> we have um, not great uh, sidewalks or access to buses. The steps are really high for, for people or um, getting up and down is, is a problem into the bus or there's a lot of crowding to get onto the bus at the taxi ranks or the bus ranks uh, for informal transit. It's not uh, a particularly pleasant environment. And then we see our buses get stuck in traffic. Um, so the only solution really is public transport that's not just for lower incomes, but for everyone. It's a high quality, high capacity, high class um, service that meets the needs for everyone. So how do we improve these conditions? <clears throat> We do this, one, one, one solution is bus rapid transit. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And so first an overview of the BRT planning guide. The BRT planning guide brings all these elements together. It's project preparation, operations, communications and marketing, the business plan, technology, infrastructure and integration. And all these different pieces come together to, to deliver a bus rapid transit system. And so the first volume is project preparation. We have project initiation, uh, we talk about YBRT, and we talk about project setup. So those are the, um, that's the information you can find in this volume. Um, and I'm gonna focus a little bit on YBRT. Um, since 2000, we see BRT has been growing rapidly as a viable and feasible and implemented uh, public transport choice. And it's partly because it's more cost effective and can be more implemented, uh, it can be implemented more quickly than rail. So this is a, a schematic of you know, how much you could buy or how much you could purchase for construction costs um, based on different types of rapid transit projects. And um, this is based on average con uh, construction costs in 2013 USD from a sample of 146 rapid transit product projects. So this is just an average, um, but it gives you a sense that uh, BRT is more cost effective. Um, and it can deliver the service and capacity of rail. So um, in this, again, there are always variations. So this is just, again, an average. But if you look at um, a bus and mixed traffic, the maximum capacity that you're gonna reach is 3,000 passengers per hour. 
With light rail, it's about 12,000 passengers per hour, which is the same as BRT, single direction with um, a per direction and a single lane. When you add passing lanes, you really increase the capacity of a bus rapid transit system. Um, and then Metro has, has higher capacity than of all of them. But BRT has more flexible service options. So <clears throat> you can do a local, express, or limited stop with BRT. Uh, the addition of a passing lane it give, gives you a lot more flexibility in how you do that. You can do that with rail with a second track. Um, but light rail, it's harder to do that with. Um, so with BRT, you do have that flexibility. And then the other thing that BRT has, which is a distinct advantage to, to BRT, is the idea that you can go on and off the corridor and you can meet demand in specific localities using direct services. So there's infrastructure on a particular part, which is in that black dotted box, but then the buses can jump off the corridor if, the, if a particular uh, segment deserves uh, a line directly to it. But ultimately, BRT solves the three main delays faced by buses on the street. The first delay being mixed traffic. <clears throat> uh, buses are stuck in congestion um, and they can't get out of it. So the second delay is intersections. Um, this is a, a roundabout actually in Nairobi. Um, and you see that there's a lot of congestion on the left hand side as the cars and vehicles approach the roundabout. But on the other side, it's relatively free. And a lot, of, a lot of times what you see are the intersections are causing bottlenecks. And then the third delay is actually at the stations and stops with boarding and alighting. When you only allow people to board through one door or they have to pay when they get on the bus, it creates these queues um, and it really slows down the bus. So BRT, um, the basics are basically putting a rapid back in rapid transit. And so what you see are, uh, with BRT, you have level boarding at stations, you have dedicated bus lanes, um, you have prepaying before you get on the bus, you try to limit uh, turns across intersections and um, help buses get through intersections more quickly, and you have a median aligned busway. Um, so with exclusive lanes, again, having that dedicated protected lane gets the buses out of traffic. Um, dedicated lanes are most critical in congested city centers, uh, where often uh, it's also the most politically challenging. Um, median aligned lanes are um, really important. Um, and the reason why is if you have curbside alignment, uh, what you really see are a lot of um, delays because of freight or people parking in the bus lane. Um, and then you also have turning movements reduce the bus speed. So this is in Seattle where they have a bus lane. And in the very back behind that truck is the bus, but the bus is stuck there because uh, the cars are turning right. So it has to wait for those cars to clear. Those cars have to wait for pedestrians to pass. But the bus lane is free and clear. So if the bus could actually get through that, um, it would be going really fast. Um, the third basic to, that really helps is level boarding. When you don't have to climb upstairs um, and when you have wide doors, it really allows for people to come on and off the bus much more quickly, especially people who are carrying things, whether it be uh, packages or children. Um, level boarding also helps with uh, universal access and, and allowing people who may be mobility impaired to, to quickly get on and off the bus. Off-board fare collection. Um, keeping people from, oh, okay. I'm hearing that the mic is cracking, so it's not working so well. Should we switch your computer mic? Uh, no. Okay. Is this better? Let me, I'm gonna hear it from David. You can hear me just fine, thanks. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll move the mic closer to me and see if that helps, and then we'll just keep going. Um, so with off-board fare collection, it can be a combination of having ticket kiosks, turnstiles, uh, proof of payment, but the idea is that you pay before you get on the bus so you don't have to pay the driver or queue up to, to pay as you enter. Um, and then with intersections, there are two main ways that you can address intersections. One is by prohibiting turns across the busway, like here in Las Vegas. Um, so that you want to simplify the phasing at intersections as much as possible. And that actually helps mix traffic too. Um, and then also having signal priority. And this is Cape Town where they um, allow buses <coughs> to clear the intersection first. 
beyond the basics, um, there's a bunch of other things to, to discuss. There's station design and bus station interface, branding and passenger information, service planning, infrastructure, integration and access. And ultimately, the thing to remember is BRT is a lot more than just infrastructure. Um, it's, it is looking at the communications plan. It is having a business plan. It is looking at what services you're going to operate. It's about the inst institutional setup. It's about contracting. Um, it's about the technology that runs it. And that's what the BRT planning guide addresses, all of these things. And so we will start with demand analysis and corridor selection um, and look at service planning, which is in volume two. So volume two is about operations. Um, and again, the things covered here are demand analysis, corridor and network developments, uh, service planning, system speed and capacity and traffic impact assessments. I'm not gonna cover all of these. Um, I'm gonna focus high level on the planning process. So you first start with passenger demand assessments. Um, you start mapping the existing public transport, um, trying to find out who's going where. Uh, this is in Johannesburg, looking at origins and destinations and then mapping the actual demand. Using this, this becomes part of their transport model, their transit model. From there, you take that information and you identify which corridor you want to do BRT on. So this is uh, from Pimpri Chinchwad. Uh, this is the Pune Pimpri Chinchwad. This is looking at their dedicated BRT corridor network that they have planned. Um, in Johannesburg, this was their first quarter that they broke up into multiple phases. Um, but you have to decide which, which is going to be your first quarter. Hopefully that's within a network plan. And then once you decide which quarter you're going to focus on, then you have to start looking at the service plan. And that's going to be really understanding how many passengers are on this route, what are going to be the routes, how many buses, and what capacity are we going to have? Are we going to have 12 meter buses, or articulated buses? Um, at what frequency? Where will we need to have stations, terminals, and depots? And then this will also help generate estimated costs and revenues, and also help us look at existing transit routes and what needs to be removed or restructured. Um, <clears throat> for more information on service planning, we will be having a, a webinar on February 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and so uh, that one will go into more depth about how to, to figure those things out. Uh, another thing you need to consider as you go, with BR, uh, go into BRT planning is the communications and marketing. Um, it's a combination of strategic planning around commu uh, for communications with the quarter development. It's also about bringing the public in to participate in the planning process. And then it's also looking at the marketing and customer service for the system. So um, you need to figure out how, who you need to engage with externally, when you need to be uh, engaging with them, uh, how early in the process do you want their in, uh, feedback and input into the planning and design. Um, but it's also equally important to be engaging with internal stakeholders as well, other city agencies that may be affected by this, um, to build an internal cohesion and make sure everyone is on message. You need to figure out how you're going to communicate the changes to the public and build support for the change because it will be a big change. Um, so you have to manage that change with communications. This is in Ichang. This is uh, showing um, renderings of what the new system will look like uh, in, a public, uh, in a public space so that people can take a look at it. And then helping celebrate milestones and be prepared for opposition or negative press or when things go wrong, because things always go wrong. So having emergency communications prepared. This is uh, Guangzhou's uh, kickoff for construction. And that helps build momentum for the, for the, the process. And, it, and, it, and it's helpful. And the, the thing to also consider is how do you, what, what's going to be the branding and the system identity? This is an... Um, Mexico City, they have uh, branded the buses, they have stations branded, so they have a similar look and feel. Um, they very purposefully chose um, icons for their stations in case uh, to deal with illiteracy um, so that people would be able to identify their stations more easily. Um, it comes to the driver's uniforms, it comes to looking at um, all the different pieces that feed into the system and having a cohesive brand. Um, and then you have communicating the system information, which is also important, again, standardizing that look um, and communicating with the public too. So it's um, 
here you have a map uh, of the local area, you have the map of the route, you have the icon um, of the station and the name of the station all on the totem right there. Um, and then this is in Nantes in France and you have the system map, you have the local map, you have information about the system. This is all on the station, you have ticketing information. So all of these things you need to be thinking about from a communications perspective. Um, it can also include social media too. Um, so how are you going to engage customers? How are you going to give them alerts about the service? Um, what's going to be the role of Facebook and Twitter um, and Instagram and all of these things that help build your brand and build your engagement with your customer base. And LA uh, has done a really good job of having, creating a visual language and information system for their different bus services. Um, so again, building this kind of cohesive visual language and information system. But for more information on how to build a communication strategy, we will be hosting a webinar on Wednesday, March 14th <coughs> on that as well. So keep your eye out for that. Let's see. We have a lot more to go through. Um, I will try to be quick. I'm sorry uh, if I'm talking too fast. Please write your questions in the Q&A section if you haven't. Um, and we'll see how far we can get into them when I finish this. Um, volume four is about the business plan. And this is actually, I think, uh, one of the more important pieces because it's the kind of back end for how the infrastructure will run from an institutional perspective. So it talks about institutional planning, the business structure, the financial modeling, how you set up your fair policy and structure, how you can uh, transition informal transit providers to BRT and uh, funding and financing of the infrastructure and operations. It's mainly inf infrastructure. Um, so this is a new economic model um, from the inform informal transit. So how, how are you going to make this be something that is distinctive in your city? Um, part of it, it starts with setting the vision, uh, uh, being clear about what success is gonna look like for you. Uh, what do you wanna achieve with this? It's, it's about having your goals and objectives for this new model um, apparent and clear for everyone. So in Dar es Salaam, they had a vision to have a modern public transport system at a reasonable cost to the user, yet profitable to the operators. They were very clear about what their objectives were. They were very clear about what their values were. So their values were to be customer driven, user friendly, innovative. All of these things were important um, foundations for creating the institutions that would be running um, the system. And Ray Avaya, uh, their aims and objectives uh, were a lot broader than just BRT. They wanted to develop an integrated transit network. They wanted to be easily understood. They wanted to improve their bus fees. They wanted to improve their travel time. Um, but they also wanted to be a viable business model for uh, existing operators that will create investment in clean technology and new buses. These are all the government policy objectives for what they're trying to achieve with their BRT. And so the business plan takes this and creates a, a working structure for how to op operationalize the, the service plan and the infrastructure. Um, and this new model is predicated on a public agency managing various public sector actors through contracts or even public sector actors through contracts. So you need to have an institutional plan, who's gonna be the institution managing this. You'd have a financial model, which looks at the uh, revenues coming in and the expenses going out and then the contracts. And so this is a really sketch of the different institutions involved, but you have the BRT entity or agency, uh, you have the operators, you have the fare collector, and in some cases you have a fund manager. Uh, so this is a kind of um, institutional structure for an uh, agency. You have a CEO, and then you have a couple of different tracks. You have administration and finance, you have communications and marketing, and you have planning and operations. And under planning, it's about route planning, as well as planning for new corridors and operations is about scheduling and control. This is the same thing. Um, so you can look at that more later. Uh, this is how uh, the agency in Dar es Salaam set itself up. It's under um, a national ministry, it has a chief executive, and then it has these kind of four main departments. Uh, this is in Transmillennial. They have um, planning management control, um, done by the actual agency, but then outside of that, they also had to uh, deal with the local government agency for infrastructure development. They have a fair collection uh, company that they contract out to, and then they have private bus. Sec they have private sector bus companies. And then 
once you have kind of your institutional setup figured out, like who you're going to contract out to, who who do you need to work with to get the infrastructure built, who's going to do maintenance of the system, all of these things need to come together in the institutional setup. But then you need to look at the financial model. Uh, one is, can you make the investment attractive, the investment environment attractive enough for a private investment? But then also understanding what fees are going to be paid to the private sector operators. Uh, what subsidies may be needed, and how do you create a financially viable system. And this is for operations more than the actual infrastructure. We're assuming the infrastructure is uh, costs um, are borne almost solely by the government. Uh, we haven't seen a situation where um, the investment was able to pay for the infrastructure, um, but we do see uh, places where the operational, the revenue coming from fares can uh, cover the cost of buses. So this is a mock, this is a, a, a schematic of what was done for the DAR system revenue allocation, where you look at the revenue coming in from the tariff. So that's your first source of income. Um, you look at what uh, uh, money is needed from the government to supplement that, and then you look at how that revenue is allocated based on the con uh, based on your contract agreements, um, and partly that's based on understanding uh, the cost for running the operations, whether it's the cost of the buses, the cost of the gas, tires, labor, all of those different things have to factor into uh, how that revenue gets allocated. And so the way that this all comes together is the business structure should delineate the roles and responsibilities of each of the actors, as well as the rights. Um, those roles and responsibilities get factored into the financial model as expenses. Um, they get factored into the financial model as revenues. So um, the rights of the private operator is to get paid a fee per kilometer. That's the revenue section. And then that should be reflected in the contracts as their obligations within the contracts as well as their rights. Um, all of these things need to speak to each other and be coherent and, co and consistent and mirror each other. Um, and all of this depends on the service plan. So understanding what service you need to operate as well. Um, a lot of systems try to include uh, the existing operators into the new BRT system. Uh, there's a whole chapter on that. And then just a note on having inclusion more broadly, when you think about planning and designing the system, whether it's bringing women in to be drivers or bringing an, um, other people into the planning process, it's just important to, to keep that in mind. So volume five is technology. Uh, that's FAIR systems, uh, the ITS, the uh, intelligent information systems that run the system as well as vehicles. Ultimately, I like to think of this as the nervous system for the BRT system. So here, these are fair, uh, fair ticketing uh, kiosks. Um, you can have um, people, this one is in DAR, you can buy a ticket at a, at a windowed kiosk or you can have an automated kiosk. Um, it also includes real-time information systems like this in Ahmedabad. That allows customers to know when um, buses are coming, but this also helps uh, let the, the, the agency know where buses are. So making sure GPS is hooked up, the information is traveling back and forth, the turnstiles can communicate how many passengers are entering uh, a particular station or leaving a particular station. All of this kind of data and information needs to be uh, connected together. And then finally, there's vehicle technology. And uh, we do recommend you try to buy the cleanest technology you can, um, given the costs um, and what's feasible in your particular situation. Um, and that we also are recommending that people start thinking about transition plans for electric buses. We're not quite there. Um, some places are buying buses, but um, it's still, uh, it still will require some transition um, planning to get us there more widely. All right, volume four is infrastructure. Uh, this might be volume five. Anyway, um, <laughs> with infrastructure, it's management and costing, it's configurations, it's design, it's the intersections and signal control, it's the stations, depots, and control center. Basically, the infrastructure plan ensures that the service plan is physically feasible. So it's looking at road width con uh, configurations, constraints. Um, it's looking at uh, how you're going to design stations. If you have a particularly high demand at a particular station, do you, how many buses, docking bays, substops do you need to build in there? Um, and also when you're thinking about your infrastructure plan, you should be thinking about pedestrian and cycling integration as um, built in along the corridor. Uh, so 
This is in Ichang. You can see that there's a good pedestrian um, sidewalk and crossings. You also have a cycle lane there. Um, and then you also want to think about substops and docking bays. So at a particular station, this is a, a schematic of it, but a substop allows um, multiple buses to use a station um, and be able to pull away into a passing lane. So what this allows is for a greater capacity at a particular station, especially if it's a high demand station. And docking bays are where buses can pull up to a particular substop. Um, so this is all in the infrastructure design um, chapters. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is bus and station alignment, um, making sure that buses can pull up to the stations, knowing where the doors are gonna be, um, knowing which docking bay has what services, um, those type of things. And finally, um, planning passing lanes at stations um, or passing lanes along the whole entire thing, like in Bogota, um, they have uh, passing lanes throughout the whole corridor. Some places just have them at stations, some places don't have passing lanes at all. Again, that's the thing that's going to really increase your capacity. And then station design is hugely important. Again, making, um, are you gonna have doors uh, that allow access to the bus, open and close? Is it gonna be open or closed environments? Um, is it gonna be a architectural element and part of your brand identity um, for the station, uh, for the system? Will there be information? How, how will you know where to go for what bus? All of that needs to be considered in the station as well as turnstiles, it's, uh, ticketing, all of that information. And finally, again, just to make sure that it's clear, like how do you get to stations, making sure that there's a uh, pedestrian access built into uh, well thought out pedestrian access thought to the stations. Um, and again, with station and bus alignment, it's making sure that there's level boarding um, and, and so that people can easily get from the bus to the station. And the other thing just to think about uh, with station design is it's also about waiting. So giving people places to sit or lean against um, and making sure there's enough space for the number of people coming into that station uh, so it doesn't get over capacity because one of the, a lot of stations can be sized too small and then it leads to overcrowding. And then the last thing to think about with infrastructure is control centers, depots, and terminals. Um, these includes where the bus is gonna be stored at night when they're not running. Uh, are there gonna be terminal stations? Where are there gonna be laybys for buses uh, when they're not in peak? Um, and the control center being the brain that controls the nervous system. So all of the ITS can feed into this system, let people know where the buses are, if they're delayed, let them know if there's problems, how to fix those problems. Um, it gets the data about passenger boarding and the lighting. And finally, with integration, um, we're looking at multimodal integration, pet access, universal access, making sure there's integration with the bicycles, uh, travel demand management, and also the integration of the transit system within the urban environment or, and specifically transit-oriented development. So um, one thing as you're considering planning your BRT is to think about intermodal integration, how does the system integrate with other systems that you already have um, it, from rail to, to bike share to other buses? Um, it's also linking it to other modes like the airport. This is uh, in Rio. Pedestrian access, uh, thinking about things like shade, especially in tropical climates. Uh, the pedestrian uh, pathway is protected even when crossing through driveways and intersections. Um, I, again, making sure there's a good pedestrian wide crossing um, at level crossing for pedestrians. Um, and also with universal access, making sure that um, everyone can get uh, to the station easily. Uh, universal access benefits everyone uh, from women and kids all the way up to the elderly. Uh, cycling integration is um, you're using this opportunity for having a BRT investment to also invest in cycle lanes. Um, but also cycle uh, bike parking near stations so that people can bike to the stations and park easily. Um, and having protected safe uh, cycleways is really important. <clears throat> and also integrating with bike share um, at stations like in Mexico City. Um, and then also making sure um, that the, the urban development around the transit is supportive. So from activating the streets 
to having a mix of uses, this will all be important for um, making sure that the that you it's really critical to integrate your transport planning with land use planning to make sure that they're complementary and supportive of each other. But the, the big thing is that this is an iterative process. Um, when you develop a service plan, you need to check it against the infrastructure plan. It may be that um, a particular bridge won't allow for the infrastructure or you know the road widths won't allow for that type of service plan. So you have to kind of go back and forth. Same with the business plan. Uh, it may be that service plan wants to have you know, 300 buses per hour, um, that's a lot. Um, but the business plan is like, we can't, we can't afford to do that. So we have to adjust. So they need to be speaking to each other and they all need to kind of come together so that we create these uh, really high quality systems that bring people to transit, um, really use our road space efficiently um, and create better, better places for our citizens, for our cities and for ourselves. Um, one last note, um, I like this because it's, uh, to open a shop is easy, but to keep it open is an art. So one thing about BRT planning is a lot of emphasis goes on getting it up and running, but once it gets up and running, it still needs uh, careful uh, stewardship and, and nurturing to keep it running over time. And then I'm almost done. Uh, so uh, just one last thing about the guide, um, there's a volume eight which uh, has some information about understanding how it works and also how you can collaborate. Uh, this is a picture, a screenshot of it online. So it's online. You can go to it at brtguide.org. Um, it's, uh, you can download a PDF if you really want to read the whole thing. Um, and it's searchable. So you can uh, search for specific things within it. Um, so welcome to the brtplanningguide.org. I hope uh, this was just a cursory introduction to all the elements that go into planning a BRT. Um, I hope there are more answers there for the questions that we'll try to answer in a minute. Um, we do want to, if you're interested in being a collaborator with us, we are welcoming people to, to come on board and you know, like help us update it and keep it more of a living document as opposed to a static document. So if you're interested, you can also let us know. Um, just uh, just one last call to action, so to speak. Um, planning a BRT is a big process. Um, it involves risk. The BRT planning guide uh, hopefully mitigates some of the risk. Um, but you know, part of it is if you want to. I just like this quote. This is also one of my favorite things about the BRT planning guide is that there are quotes and spears throughout it. So if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to fetch the wood and allocate the jobs and divide the work but teach them the yearning for the wide open sea. So um, the whole point of this is to create better cities for, for everyone who lives in there. So um, I hope that this helps. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Amay, for this presentation. I see that there are more questions coming in. Please feel free to submit them as we look through them now. Um, we can start with the first question submitted by Chris. In the US, how can we change public perception of bus systems or public transport networks as a whole? Seems like in this country, we have trouble convincing people of the benefits that improving public transit or reducing private car usage can have on our population as a whole. Interested in hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Chris. Okay, um, I think actually the best way to transform the perceptions about bus is to improve bus service. So, and I think we've been seeing that in a lot of different US cities. So uh, San Francisco has seen an increase in ridership. Where we see increases in ridership, what we're seeing is that it's a result of the um, improvements to service. So we see that in San Francisco with all door boarding. We see that in Seattle um, with their investments in creating rapid transit and rapid ride. Um, so I think that's the main thing that you can do is what people really want from transit is reliability convenience um, and accessibility. So if you can create a reliable and convenient service, people will use it. There are other ways to do it which, with public outreach uh, campaigns, uh, education campaigns, that some cities have done some really amazing jobs with uh, their communications. So the LA is one that I like to highlight. Um, they, they've done a public education outreach campaign about like choosing transit over the car, um, which I think is brilliant and you should check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, 
and you can also do things like uh, outreach to school children um, because you want to try to target people who are, are pretty open-minded um, and get them using it early and often. Um, and then they'll be more attuned to it as part of just a way of life. Great. Thank you, M.A. The next question we have here is, are there any successful BRT systems in the case of Greenfield City? If so, what are the strategies followed? possibly any specific cases in Asia? Um, there are. Uh, I'm trying to, let me, let me frame it this way. When uh, we have been involved with Greenfield Cities in China, we have worked with their street design um, to plan space for BRT. Uh, it's, it's tricky because when you do Greenfield, you're kind of hoping that people will move in. You don't really have the demand right there. So you uh, build in the, um, you, you look at the arterial streets, you look at the street design to make sure that there's space for BRT. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know, Luke, if you have any other. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, that uh, the, the issue is uh, that you, you can't fully build a, a system before the, the demand is there. Um, but uh, you have to lay out the, the development to allow the, uh, the creation of a system further down when the, the demand uh, grows. So, and you have to grow the system together with the demand. So it needs to evolve. Uh, hopefully the Greenfield City will uh, begin a fairly dense, compact mix and have all the qualities that will support um, high quality transit. Um, but it will take some time before it, it reaches the kind of density that actually provides the, the, the ridership typically. So uh, yes, putting in place, the, the first element that's needed is the, the, the grid of arterials um, to, to run transit and cover um, all the development. And secondly, the grid of um, local streets and, and pathways uh, that allow uh, excellent direct uh, safe access to the to the stations. So this needs to be put in place very early in the process. And that was Luke Nadal, our uh, technical director for urban development here at SPD. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, the next question is also by Chris. In terms of funding the system, how to make sure avoid situations like those seen in Transmillennial, where the system is over capacity and also unaffordable for lower income residents? What types of subsidies are necessary to complement fare box revenue? So I think this is a, uh, this is a little bit of, uh, we need to transform the way that we think about paying for public transport. Um, I think for a while there was this hope and uh, that BRT would be self-sufficient, uh, self-financing uh, from an operations perspective. Um, and there was a lot of emphasis on that. And so Transmillennio is billed as a self-financing uh, operations. Um, and, I, and I don't think that's the right approach. I think when we're thinking about public transport, we need to be thinking about it as a public utility. And what does it mean for us to invest in providing this public utility to the public? Um, and so I'm not, it, it varies from place to place. Um, and some places labor costs are what drive the, um, the, the costs of operations. In some places it's the technology. Um, so I, it, it's hard to say exactly what's the best way to approach this, but I do think we need to not assume, we, should, we shouldn't use the term subsidy, even though I think I did. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't use the term subsidy for public transport because car, car driving is also heavily subsidized in many, many different ways. Um, so, uh, but we never really approach it that way. I think we should be like, what, do, what it, will it take for us to invest in this public, public utility, which is critical to the functioning of our city? Great. Um, on to the next question. Um, I'm going to skip down a little bit. I see there are questions about what other types of webinars we will have. We are still planning some with other authors, but we will share a slide of, oh, here we go, of ones that are confirmed, but we do plan on having them until the end of May or the end of June. So TBD, for example, on implementation, 
but for other folks who had questions about communication specifically, you can tune in on March 14th with Carlos Pardo from Despacio. Okay, we have a question here from Darren. Could you talk about greenhouse gas emissions reductions from implementing BRT? Sure. Um, so it, again, it depends on which city you're in. Um, in some places you get huge reductions just because the existing buses are, or the informal transit is like 14 or 15 years old. They're uh, highly polluting um, and inefficient engines. Um, so that's a big issue if you're switching from uh, an informal unregulated system. Um, the other big shift that you'll get from greenhouse gas reductions is mode shift, moving people out of their cars um, onto transit. And so that's where you'll see the other big uh, gains. Uh, there are some technological, um, well, so you can get cleaner buses. I mean, often BRT is a way to uh, galvanize um, the introduction of newer fleets of buses. So uh, in, Re in Johannesburg, Ray of I brought in Euro 4 buses, which was the first time Euro 4 buses were brought into the country. So you can use uh, BRT to do that as well. But it also depends on the quality of your fuel. So if you don't actually have clean, cleaner fuels, then getting cleaner buses won't necessarily help. Great. I'm going to skip down to a question from Rick. What are the essential elements required to generate meaningful transit-oriented development around BRT stations? And what are the best examples of this? I'll, I'll start, but then Luke can finish. <laughs> um, I think the first thing to start with is making sure that you're aligning uh, your planning, your urban development planning and your land use planning with your transit system planning. And so uh, making sure that those two things are happening together. Um, so there's a policy framework, making sure that uh, there's the right densities, the right mix of uses, um, looking at how those are going to be along the corridor. Um, and then there's also the, um, uh, I want to I say uh, infrastructure piece of it. So making sure that there's a fine grain of blocks um, so that it's easily walkable, making sure that there's investments in the walking environment, making sure that you have cycling uh, networks built out, not just along the corridor, but leading to the corridor. Um, so those pieces. I don't know if you want to add more, Luke. Um, Emma, you covered it very well. Um, uh, the focus of this webinar is, is not on TOD, but we are running a series of um, webinars that are specifically addressing TOD, so I encourage you to stay tuned and to, um, and to join us on these, uh, on these events. Um, and best practices for TOD around BRT. Cleveland um, in the U.S. Uh, did a lot of like land banking and uh, they did a huge investment from in the entire right of way to really encourage development along the corridor. Um, and uh, that's the first one that comes to mind. A lot of places have a lot of density already. So it's a question of fine tuning the, the areas around it. Great, thank you, Amé. Um, let me skip down. This is a question from Shamiz Patel, uh, who entered the webinar late, but that's okay because everything is recorded and we will share it on our website. So one of the questions we did not address yes, yet is, in a country where safety is an issue, what are cost-effective ways to increase safety on BRT to encourage and reassure users? Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, one is about, uh, approach to the station, so making sure that it's well lit, that there's adequate pedestrian space um, for walking, um, and that the space is activated through, um, you know, land uses, right? So it's the approach to the station that's one thing that you should think about from a safety perspective. Um, when you're actually in the station and, and on the bus, I think the biggest issue is overcrowding. Um, so that's partly about making sure that the stations are designed to handle the capacity that will happen at the station so they don't get overcrowded. Um, and then the flip side of that is making sure that the bus service is, is adequately, um, adequately frequent so that uh, you don't have overcrowding on the bus. Because overcrowding is the thing that leads to crime um, in most cases. Um, in other places with the actual station design, they try to make 
the station's really well lit, um, highly transparent so that people can see through them. So it's, you don't have like corners and um, shadows where people can hide. Um, partly it's about manning the stations and our people in the stations um, so that you have an active presence there. So people don't, uh, so there's some kind of surveillance happening. Um, a lot of people have talked about putting cameras on buses or putting cameras in stations. I think that is one way to do it. However, that um, remote surveillance is less of a deterrent than uh, having the, the presence right in the station or on the bus. Great, thank you, Ame. Uh, now I will raise a question that Steve actually sent over email prior to the webinar. Uh, one of his questions is, what are barriers we face to getting signal priority policies approved for city buses and for BRTs? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have an answer to it. Um, my limited experience is it's, um, it's um, uh, municipal inertia. It seems to be kind of the, the bigger thing and then the money that it would cost to implement the signal priority. Um, I, I think from what I've seen, there's also uh, the granularity of municipalities. So like if you have a system that cuts through different uh, uh, municip municipal regimes, I don't know, if that's not the right word, um, jurisdictions. <laughs> um, uh, one jurisdiction may be more progressive and go forward with it, and one may be a little bit more reticent. So I think it's it's kind of an issue of political will, um, even though it's a tech, it's a highly technical thing. Um, and and the, the political challenge or the challenge always is uh, the car versus the bus. So understanding that dynamic and having someone who will, who's willing to champion the investment. Great. Uh, this next question is submitted by Carlos about dedicated lanes. Do you think it is viable a, B, a BRT project without dedicated lanes, but with priority over private cars on streets, just like emergency services do now, like fire trucks or ambulances? So I guess it's it's questioning the quality of the BRT without dedicated lanes, but with <clears throat> possibly TSP. Um, I think if you don't have dedicated lanes, well, you don't have a bus rapid transit system. If you're only talking about letting in emergency vehicles into the dedicated lane, um, the, most systems do something like that. And I think that makes sense. The problem you have is when uh, drawing the line, like, is it just ambulances? Is it any police car that wants to get in at any time? Is it the president who wants to get through the city fast? Um, knowing how to enforce that and when to draw the lines is, is, is the problem. Because once you start opening that, that gate a little bit, um, it can open really wide. So you have to be really, I think, strict about what you do let in or don't let in. I think it also depends on the demand on the particular BRT system. So some systems have frequencies of, you know, 60 buses plus. Uh, an hour. That's a bus every minute. So there's safety considerations that you have to kind of keep in mind um, when you have high high demand systems. Um, but yeah, I just think you need to be careful about um, letting things, letting other vehicles into the dedicated lanes, because it becomes a really slippery slope. Great. So thank you everyone for all your questions. But considering uh, this specific webinar is about the guide and an overview. I'm going to um, bring up some questions on how to use the guide and um, what are some changes that have been made. So here we have a question from uh, Udval. What are the implementation barriers such as political, financial, and organizational? How can this guide help in terms of addressing these barriers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, that if you don't have, um, you need a political champion, you need to have political support, you need to have political will. Um, and I think what this guide can do, <laughs> what the guide does for, for that is just highlight the need that, for that. And there are several strategies that you can use. Um, this is a little bit under project initiation to, to build that political will. Um, partly it's knowing that there are solutions out there, partly it's site visits or peer-to-peer -peer outreach. Um, but if you don't have political will, these, 
these are big projects and any big project will um, encounter opposition, whether it's from car drivers or from existing transport operators um, or businesses who are afraid of what BRT might bring to their community, like, or residents who don't wanna bring BRT to it. You know, like there's always gonna be some opposition. So unless you have strong political will, you're not, it, you're, it's gonna be difficult. Um, from the financial constraints, um, I think what the guide does, and this is um, new to the guide from the previous version, is it basically says, look, you have to create a financial model. If you don't um, understand what the revenues coming in and what the expenses going out are, you're not gonna have a sustainable system. Um, so you really need to understand what those financial needs are. Um, the other thing that uh, this can help with is, uh, especially in places where you have a lot of informal transit, um, the business model for informal transit is um, based on kind of running the vehicle into the ground, um, not paying your workers uh, over time, you know, working really long days, uh, competing for passengers on the streets. Um, so when you're changing the economic model, you have to have tools to explain what, that, what this new economic model will be, this new business model. And so creating a financial model will help with that. Um, and then, I forget what the last one was, but. Great, thanks, Ame. Um, This is a question from Gabriel. Oh, hey, can you? Hi, ITDP. <laughs> <laughs> can you please highlight the main updates that were incorporated between the third and the fourth edition of the BRT planning guide? There's a ton. So um, the the biggest ones are we have this uh, a much more expanded knowledge around well everything, but service planning is the big one that was unpacked, like really understanding what, how to create a service plan. Um, it has uh, like all the equations you could possibly need to figure out um, all the, the elements that go into that. There's also communications was really um, deepened in terms of the role of communications, both from uh, the planning perspective, as well as the marketing and customer service perspective. Um, the, there was not a chapter on business development, well there was, but the business plan has really also been really further disaggregated into what do you need for the institutional plan? How do you create a financial model? That wasn't in the previous guide. Um, what, do you, what do you mean by a fair policy and structure? How do, the ITS stuff has also significantly changed as well. Um, it, there's, it really has kind of, uh, I don't know how to exponentially increased uh, in terms of the knowledge that's in the guide right now. Um, and then we also really um, took a look at integration and what that meant and looking at pedestrian, um, cycling, uh, multimodal, uh, TOD, like all the different elements that you need to think about from your urban environment and integrating those. So it's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot different, there's a lot more information. It's pretty cool. Great, so unfortunately this will be the last question that I pose, but um, we have collected everything you have submitted and I will email everyone the answers which will be posted on the website. So although they were not answered right now, they will be answered eventually. And also if you have any other questions, please feel free to submit them to me. Um, my email, christina.jang, was included in your registration and will also be included in the follow-up email. Okay, so here's to the last question. Are you planning to publish another BRT standard? I'm excluding the this year part. <laughs> if yes, when? Are there going to be big changes? And if yes, were they inspired by the new planning guide? Um, the, no, we're not planning on <laughs> updating another BRT standard this year. We do plan to update it. Um, there was a big update that happened, I think, two years ago. Um, a lot of that did actually uh, come from the changes that we're seeing and are reflected in the BRT planning guide. Um, so I think the plan is to update the standard in 2019 or 2020, um, but not this year. And, um, but going, if you, in terms of updating the BRT planning guide, um, again, we wanna have this be a, a living document, um, have, be updated all the time as much as possible in real time. So if you are interested in being part of the community that uh, collaborates to keep this updated, please let us know. Um, and the other thing that this is we're thinking about is uh, maybe the questions that we get here
can start being part of a forum that we develop for the VOT planning guide where uh, people can ask questions and then the broader community, which is infinitely smarter than, than me, can contribute to the answers. So um, we'll let you know how that goes too. Great. So thank you, Amay, for hosting this webinar today and also kicking off our BR Team Planning Guide webinar series. Uh, thank you Yay. to all the attendees. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, we had about 100 people from all over the world joining, and we really appreciate you submitting your questions and making this session more interactive. We hope to see you online again soon. If you look at the screen, we have one on February 20th. Um, the time isn't on there, but it will be at the same time, 11 a.m. EST, and that will be with Walter Hook, and he will talk about uh, service planning, which is volume two. And then following that, we will have one on communication strategy on March 14th. If you keep checking this website, you will see dates uh, for April, May, and possibly June. So please stay tuned for other installments that we will have throughout 2018. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you.